This is Inside the Tour in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. I'm Alistair Eakin, Lions fanatic and rugby commentator. I plan to stay connected to this summer's tour with the official Lions app powered by Vodafone. Hello, we're at Inside Tour Pod on social and there's quite a bit of swearing on the way, just to warn you. Not too many phones around in 1997, but there were cameras. Inside the Tour, the full story of the British and Irish Lions in South Africa. I always remember our first meeting. So we arrived on the Sunday, on the Monday morning, in the corner of the room, there was a tripod and a camera and we were being filmed. That was us, yeah, that was us. And there were a couple of guys in the room with the camera equipment, and I didn't know who they were. I'm Duncan Humphreys, I'm a cameraman. And I'm Fred Rees, and we made the film Living With Alliance. Never met them before, and they'd not been introduced. So I think it was Fred and I. Yeah, I think my dad, who was also involved in the production, he was the sort of producer of it and third cameraman. Fred and I had worked quite a bit together in various things. And I knocked on the door and Fred was doing nothing and we went to the pub. Yeah, we just thought, wouldn't it be brilliant to be able to make a documentary about the upcoming Lions tour? And that was about four pints in. And in a sort of, a fit of sort of drunken enthusiasm, we decided we would actually pursue it. Pursue it, pursue it. So it's episode seven of the series. And before we arrive at the test matches to decide the Lions tour of South Africa in 1997, we need to explore one of the factors which made it so unique. I remember watching the series on TV, but I remember it more thanks to the remarkable film which was made, Living With Lions. It's become a cult hit, the seminal fly on the wall documentary, way ahead of its time. Wherever the Lions went, so did the cameras, worked by three rugby superfans, themselves on the trip of a lifetime, who ended up making one of the finest sporting movies. After you, Doug. <laughs> uh, my name's Duncan Humphreys. My role in 97 uh, was director cameraman, I, I suppose. Fred and I worked the same, in, in exactly the same roles and capacities throughout it. We were also the originators of the idea in a drunken stupor. <laughs> yeah, so hi, I'm Fred Rees. I was the co-director with Duncan on Living With Lions. I was also one of the cameramen and I was responsible for editing the whole thing and putting it all together, which was quite a challenge. I'd been doing a lot of um, small commercials, anything with a telephone number on it. I, I was doing these commercials and they were driving me mad because it was, it was, they were fairly soul destroying, let's put it like that. Because of the price point and everything, you always did your what was called the telecine, where you put the film onto tape in early in the morning. And it meant that by 11 o'clock, you were done and dusted. Fred had a, an office at the time in uh, Richmond Muse, wasn't it? Uh, Fred, Portland, was it? Portland Muse in Portland, Sony, yeah. Portland Muse, that's right. And I knocked on the door and Fred was doing nothing and we went to the pub. I was complaining about bitterly about my... Um, you know, the lack of, shall we say, sort of satisfaction in what I, I was doing. And Fred says, well, what the bloody hell are you going to do about it then? And I said, well, I don't know, why don't we go and make a film about the lions? And he said, yeah, that's a really good idea. And I, I really just... And so we started looking at it, didn't we? Is that basic? That's basically what I remember. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think that, you know, Duncan and I used to meet up fairly regularly and, <laughs> and go down the pub and talk about rugby endlessly. We'd just sit there drinking beer, talking about rugby and films and things. And, yeah, this sort of idea came up after a dunk says about four pints. And, um, yeah, so the following day, I think after that session in the pub, Dunk got on the phone and phoned up Fran Cotton. Fran Cotton, I was the manager of the 1997 British and Irish Lions. And then it sort of transpired that Fran was, you know, they were kind of thinking about doing something along those lines and they hadn't quite worked out what. And that was kind of how it began, really. Yeah, um, I think it had been done once before, but um, not very well. And I've got to say, I was extremely nervous about giving it the green light because uh, you're never quite sure how this is going to come out. I vaguely knew Fran from his playing days when I was sort of a young, younger player and he'd done a bit of coaching. Uh, I knew him, let's put it like that, vaguely, however vaguely. So, it, you know, the, the call got through. I was, I was quite surprised. Um, you know, I phoned them up at Cotton Traders and, you know, got pretty quickly to be talking to Fran. It led us to, I had to 
didn't I have to go to Bedford Rugby Club? Kind of, they were lobbing money at the game like nobody's business. Fran just said, yeah, no, you can do it, as long because they hadn't really got anyone else around. I remember the meeting, meeting them, and they were very, very nice people. You had to be with them for uh, five, ten minutes to know you were dealing with genuine people who were uh, extremely good at their uh, their job. By the time I met them, it was a fait accompli they were going to do it. All I was interested in to make sure they didn't interfere, you know, and that they blended into the background, and uh, they assured me that was uh, their approach. If you if you actually look at back then, I mean, there was big questions whether the Lions were ever even going to survive. You know, it, it, what was their place in the modern game? And, and the media was actually full of it. You know, this could well be the last Lions tour. Yeah, I think that there was a thing with the Lions at that point because, as Dunk's saying, the sort of game shifting to the professional era. And it was the first Lions tour within that scope. And obviously money, therefore, was became a much more important thing for them. So when we sort of pitched the idea of the film to them, you know, they their sort of thinking was, well, we just need a whole bunch of cash up front to, you know, help oil the wheels of our tour. And, uh, yeah, so they said to us, well, if you pay us 30,000 quid, then you can have the rights to make the film. And then once the Lions had that money and we had the rights, we'd then be able to go to the Beeb or ITV or whoever it was, you know, and get them to commission the documentary. Um, sort of sadly for us when we so we decided we would pay the 30 grand so we then had the rights when we went to the tv stations you know to a man they all looked at us like we were crazy and said why have you done that there's no film in this the lines are going to get smashed no one's interested in it which then sort of left us in a position where we either had to throw our 30 grand away because obviously the lines weren't going to hand it back to us at that point or we had to somehow stump up the money ourselves to make the film and uh, yeah, so sort of a fit of madness, that's kind of what we decided to do. So we sort of rustled together as much as we could, basically remortgaged our house and, um, yeah, and leapt over the edge. They did it extremely well because initially you were a little bit wary of them and were very conscious that they were there in a meeting or whatever. But halfway th- through the trip, you know, you didn't even think about it. They were just there, so... Uh, they got some incredible footage, I think, put together well. If the whole thing had gone sort of tits up, it would have been, yeah, it would have been quite catastrophic in a way. Um, we probably wouldn't have quite ended up on the street, but yeah, yeah, it was a big gamble for sure. Then we ended up going down to um, Weybridge, where, the, where they were based, before flying out. That was quite interesting. We got some pretty good material in in that time, but it was they were feeling out each other, the players. They kind of just accepted us as they. I don't think they put two and two together at that point that we were going to be there for the entire time. It it sort of became a little bit Big Brotherish. You forgot the cameras were there for a while. Uh, The camera crew were embedded with us. James Robson, team doctor. I'm Austin Healy, and this is the story of the 1997 British and Irish Lions. They were a a father and and son's uh, outfit with a friend and and the father had, I think, withdrawn all his pension fund and so this was really a punt on something that had never been done before and they were of the character and and the Lions as a team were so receptive to these guys and so they became true fly on the wall. And no one had been in it that scenario before. You know, this is before any sort of TV shows like that even appeared. Having a camera there 24-7. And again, a lot of the stuff in 97 was just natural. It wasn't staged. There was no sort of we need a we need something funny here, we need a vox pop or something. And there was a you know, there was a natural flow to that tour and some great characters on it. I mean, nowadays the players will have media sheets, then they'll have on Wednesday you're doing rafting with the camera crew or whatever it is. In those days, no, there was nothing. It wasn't sort of confronted in, a, in any sort of major way that we were going to be there. No, I don't remember there ever being a meeting where the, we were sort of introduced to the team and there was any real explanation with us being present anyway of no. you know what was going on. I mean, I think sort of from a filmic point of view, we we definitely did approach the thing of wanting to capture what was genuinely happening. So therefore, in effect, being a true kind of fly-on-the-wall film as much as we could do that. If you film people doing things 
where they can't really think about the camera, they have to just focus on what they're doing, then obviously you capture the real truth of what is happening. And therein lies the power of, you know, watching a documentary. If you feel that it's true and you're really in the moment with the people as they're going through the things that they're doing, within that lies a good film. They wanted full access, which they got. I mean, you know, they could go anywhere they wanted. You know, they were out and about uh, around the hotel. I suppose we were a little bit naive at the time and I can understand why people would be very reluctant now to do it. But uh, looking back, I break out in a cold sweat thinking about it. As it turned out, it was a successful tour. We had a lot of great personalities on that trip in terms of the players. Hello, this is John Bentley. We're on the 1997 British United Lines tour of South Africa. On the Friday night during the drinking session, I ended up still talking to them and they didn't have the camera with them. And I said, come on, lads, then. Why are you here? What are you doing? And they said, oh, we want fly on the wall. And I said, oh, you'll never get it. There's only a player can get fly on the wall. You'll never be able to get fly on the wall. And that's all I said. Yeah, I do remember that. I mean, obviously, Bentos has a slightly rose-coloured view of that. <laughs> because when we turned up to do the shoot, we'd already decided that we were going to try and give the players cameras. So we had these three little DV cam cameras that we turned up with. Um, so that was always on our agenda to get them to try and help. I mean, obviously, John was fantastic in that and sort of leapt into it and grasped it with both hands. And, you know, his enthusiasm for that shines through in the film. And it's a really integral part of the film. <laughs> you wonder what on earth he was up to. There was a knock on my door and all the boys were preparing to go to the gym. And there was a knock on my door and one of the lads, film crew boys, so Bentos, how are you doing? He says, then who are you with? I said, I'm on my own. He said, can I come in? Yeah. And I went into the, he came into the room and he had a little carrier bag and inside it, he pulled out a, a piece of equipment that I'd never seen anything like. It's tiny, a little handheld camera. And he said, it's yours. Do what you want with it. And I actually took it to the gym. Nobody knew it was their camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody knew it. They all thought it was mine. He lost it as well. Yeah, well, that... Well, that then... He lost the first one, so we were down to two. There was a bit of a discussion about what actually happened to that camera, wasn't it? Yeah. Because I think without going into the details of it, there were certain things recorded on it that really no one would want to see the light of day. That was, honestly, <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> so we did believe that the one person I won't mention who did get sort of caught on camera... This is Austin Healy. ...doing whatever he was doing. It's a shame you can't tell it if this is Watershed. Well, after much deliberation, we've decided we're going to let Austin tell his little story. It'll make him happy. But be warned, the next couple of minutes includes quite a selection of swear words. So this is what happened when John Bentley caught Austin Healy in, shall we say, a compromising position. He broke into my room with the camera on and then kicked the door down in the bathroom, was filmed me, and then ran out. And I tried to catch him and he had two support staff who tackled me to the ground, which is a bit freaky at that stage. And then, then, we had a, then we had lunch and then a training session. But through the training session, he was like, lads, I'm going to... This is a big film. It's a big show in tonight. I've, got, I've sorted out a big screen, blah, blah, blah. And he'd locked his door of his room so I couldn't get in. So I climbed out of my room, uh, up a floor, over the roof, down a floor, onto his balcony and came in. And I searched everywhere in his room, everywhere for it. I thought, fuck, can't find it. He must have taken it with him. And then I pulled out the bottom drawer all the way and it was underneath the bottom drawer. I found it. So I, I played it and I took it all the way to the point where he opened the door and then I blacked it out and then I started it again when he was running down the hallway. So it was basically door opens, blacked out, running down the hallway, got him, got him, what a scouse dickhead, blah, blah, blah. Put it all away, tidied it, pushed it away, climbed back up, back over, got back in my room. And then he's going on about dinner and all the lads are going, you're going to get it, you're going to get it, you're in so much shit, this is brilliant. They've got popcorn out and all sorts. And then he goes to show it and I'm just sat there like a smug little scouse prick. And he presses play and he's like, you're getting it now, you scouse dickhead. And uh, presses play and it blacks out. And just that was the highlight of the tour for me, actually. Seeing his face just stone cold look at me go, you little bastard. And that, that for me, cemented our friendship forever. <laughs> it was very, very funny. I love that bit. That, that definitely my highlight of the tour. I think, I think we'll cut this off at that point. <laughs> 
And the story continues after this message from Vodafone's Lions ambassador. Hi, it's Sam Warburton here, captain on the last two Lions tours. Ahead of this year's trip to South Africa, look out for Lions Live, created by Vodafone, bringing you closer to the Lions. We'll have pre-match analysis and discussion, plus exclusive Vodafone Lions content and guests from inside the camp. For more information, make sure you download the official British and Irish Lions app, powered by Vodafone. Hope you can join us for Lions Live. This is Inside the Tour, and on this episode, the story of the Fly on the Wall documentary that was made surrounding the tour of 1997, Living with Lions. We're with the film's creators, Duncan Humphreys and Fred Rees. The initial edit that we made of the film was about 10 hours long, and then the final piece ended up being just shy of three hours. Yeah, there was definitely stuff that hit the cutting room floor that I'm sure <laughs> people would have enjoyed, but wasn't necessarily quite right. Fred put the editorial together in a way as well that was very filmic. It wasn't a traditional documentary. These guys were just so good at actually drawing things out. And you'd be mic'd up for most of the day. So, you know, when you'd had the mic on for a period of time, you actually forgot. And sometimes, of course, you know, you wish you'd remembered because you maybe said something that was recorded and later used. But I think they did phenomenally well. The key elements were technically there was the technical ability to mic the two main coaches up. That, that was incredible. We had no kind of agreement with the Lions that we should we would be able to mic them up. And literally on the very first day of training, our sound man wandered out with two radio mics and just mic them up. I think Geech and uh, Jim just assumed that was what was going to happen, however much they were unhappy about it. And the next thing you know, they were <laughs> the poor buggers were mic'd up every single day of the tour. <laughs> You know, it, it's what elevated it to being so special was their relationship for starters because it gave a grounding in kind of what was going on and, and the emotions uh, uh, surrounding it. But also then as the games became more and more kind of important, they took on this role of a bit like, I mean, I, I, I hate to say the Muppets, but, you know, <laughs> the two old men up in, up in the balconies looking down and, and, get, and they were just so involved and, you know, sort of, calm down, Jim, calm down, Jim. You know, and it, it was just, it just was a, you know, you saw how close they were as, as, as both friends and colleagues and coaches. You know, that part of the film came from, you know, the sound man, David Brill, just wandering over and miking them up. That's how I remember it, Fred. Is that you? Yeah, yeah, well, I don't... I can't recall there being any sort of outward kind of hostility from Jim and Ian in terms of us making the film. I mean, obviously, internally, they were pretty worried about it, I guess, to begin with. Yeah, and as Doug's saying, when David Brill went and put the radio mics on them, they just presumed that that was what they were meant to do, so they just sort of went along with it, you know, and then they're just sort of so caught up in what they're doing that they sort of forgot about it. I mean, maybe internally there was many more debates about what the hell were they doing, letting people film film them. But, um, yeah, they didn't they didn't really broadcast that that to us. I mean, they're such a lovely no. pair of gentlemen, aren't they, that they, yeah. you know, they, they, were, they were always very kind to us. And I think in a way the whole radio waking them up every morning became sort of part of their ritual for well, the, um, sort of beginning their training yeah. sessions and their meetings and things. Jim used to mic himself up by the end of it. I mean, yeah, he, in the he, end. Uh, David would just give him the microphone and, and Jim would mic himself up. But, you know, that it, it's... Um, I think there was only one instance where it was where the... the um, who was the, the Welsh hooker at the time, the blonde... Barry Williams. Yeah, Barry Williams and Mark, was it Mark Regan had a little kickoff? Oh, uh, yeah, I remember. It that. was then that it was the only time where kind of you see Jim react to the, the camera was right there. He knew he was microphoned. We got it pretty clearly what was being said between the two gentlemen. And, you know, Jim, you saw Jim go, look, there's cameras around, you can't do that. And that was the only mention of in the whole time of, of cameras being there. On the very first match of the tour... Jason Leonard was captain for that first game. 
at East London. Jason asked us to leave the changing room before he gave his team speech. The film crew were in the changing room and Jason told them to get out. I couldn't understand from Jason, the player's point of view, you know, you're uh, getting yourself ready for a game. You don't want anybody poking a uh, camera in your face. In the sanctuary, the inner sanctum. And I think we felt pretty strongly that, you know, if you're out for one, you're out for them all. And without being in those, you you haven't got a film, basically. They made a decision to go up, approach Fran and if they don't get in the first chain room, there would no chance, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go in any of the chain rooms. So it was important they had to get back in. And so I went and spoke to, uh, well, we went and spoke to Fran, who just backed us 100%. I didn't realise that the players had kicked them out of the dressing room. What did they say? Did, I, did they actually take them back in the dressing room? Is that what they're saying? I don't... This isn't part of the deal. Blah, 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 blah. It was only Tim Robber who kind of kicked us out of the changing room, so I filmed the door instead. Fran went in, had a quiet word with Jason, let them back in. From then on, they were in every chain room, and you never knew they were there. In fairness, they actually did it ex- very discreetly. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have known they were in the dressing room, quite honestly. Up until that point, you know, the, unless you were a rugby player of that kind of level, no one, no one had ever seen what it was like inside that environment. You know, and when Dunk was the one who, the camera only first sort of went in to film that first dressing room, and I remember Jason saying to him, you know, we'll come in for a minute and, you know, if I don't want you there, I'll give you a look and you'll know the look. <laughs> and at that point, you you need to leave. After that, some of the footage they got of uh, dressing room incidents and Woody firing off of it. I was saying a few expletives. I would say a lot of expletives. Well, I tell you, there is a couple of things in that. I love the, the way these things get kind of changed around after a while. I'm Keith Wood. I was the Lions hooker in 1997. I had uh, 34 F-bombs in 30 seconds and they cut it down to 17. And actually, that's the one that's in there. The reality is it's twice as many. And I know that Gus got was just wetting himself in the background saying, my God, he's a looper. There's a bit of that where basically Woody manages to sort of drop 13 F-bombs in about 10 seconds. And we sort of listened to this and we thought, wow, this is actually, this is so much swearing that, you know, how's this going to go down? So we phoned Woody up and we sort of said, look, Keith, we, you know, we've got this scene, it's really brilliant, but, you know, we'll just play it to you. So we played it to him and he, and he spoke, bloody hell, well, maybe you should take out a few of those swear, those swear words because I might have to open a supermarket at some point and <laughs> it might not help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so using the magic of editing, we managed to chop half of them out. And then we phoned him up and we played it to him. And he listened to it and he said, oh, no, that doesn't sound right. You better just throw them yeah. all back in again. So uh, he, he, was one of the, he, he was one of the ones that was, was always there for a, a, a chat. And, you know, yeah, uh, he was. And he, you know, he, he was very open. And, but he did, when he, got, when he got into, when he got his game face on, um, it, the, the, the F-bombs did, did fly. Let's put it like that. I mean, it's quite interesting when it comes to swearing, because if you cut the swear words out, the thing is still just about as powerful as it would be with the swear words in a funny way. It sort of shows when you edit that kind of stuff how pointless swearing can be. But, yeah, I think it was sort of Woody's use of words around his swearing, you know, because he was always about, it's our day and we make it and we'll take the pain and we'll take the plaudits at the at the end of it and it's our greatest moment. And, you know, that kind of stuff was was truly inspiring. The guys that did that video, you you, you didn't know they were there. They were so... Um, inconspicuous they would sit in the corner of the room with a longer lens you would barely know that they were there we didn't really no, nobody had any clue that any of this thing was going to happen really anyway we knew we'd somebody around with us but we didn't quite know what it was going to be I got as much a shock as anybody else that I was relatively prominent in it because I just like they never asked they didn't ask one question It was 173 hours of footage. They didn't ask one question, you know, so that's pretty impressive. They became like part of the team, really, because they got all the Lions kit and what have you, and that had been done on purpose to to, to have them blend with us. They actually became part of the team. You know, they they became good mates. I I really enjoyed their company and what have you, but they were very discreet with the filming. It made good viewing, didn't it? Would they have done it again? (sighs) I break out in a cold sweat thinking if... uh... If the tour had gone all wrong, we'd lost the Test Series, it may have had a completely different slant on it, but uh, fortunately it was a successful tour. I think the personality of the players really did come out uh, on that video, and 
and it did properly represent them as a group of uh, people. So I was very pleased with the outcome of it. A few years later, I was filming the Adidas advert for the the Lions tour to New Zealand, where they played British Bulldogs, where Brian O'Driscoll was captain. Hi, this is Brian O'Driscoll, and I was lucky enough to be on four British and Irish Lions tour and captain in 05. I'm filming an interview with Brian O'Driscoll, but there is also Jono, who's not on the tour, but he's an Adidas ambassador, so Jono's there, and I'd I'd been chatting with Jono. And Brian O'Driscoll comes over and sat, stands there and starts talking. And, he, and, and, and in the interview, you know, it's, you know, what got you into rugby? And Brian O'Driscoll said, I can tell you what made me choose rugby. A film called Living With Lions. And he sort of went on about Living With Lions a little bit. And then, you know, as we finished the interview, he looked at Jono and said, what are you laughing about? And he said he was one of the guys that did it. I was doing my final school exams. I was in boarding school and it was that escapism, first of all, from, you know, study and from those pressurized exams that were going to be your future. And so I remember us all gathering in the uh, in the TV room as a collective and trying to fight for you know good chairs, for good positioning. And it was our first real appreciation for Lions on TV. I don't remember at all in 93. So to have it broadcast the way it was and the detail and we got you know we got to be part of it um, and you were on that journey with them it was it was unique to anything that we'd experienced before from um, an access point of view and I think maybe it's even access that we thought we were getting at the time but in you know again retrospectively you weren't you only got it in the video and and understanding the characters behind the players and the court sessions also it was a moment in time where the reason is one of the great behind the scenes videos is because it hadn't been done before. We hadn't seen and, you know, first mover on it. Whereas even four years later, people start playing to the camera. They knew the credibility that came from being a personality on tour. Um, so there was none of that. There was no one trying to usurp the next person um, by being the funniest guy or being the the crazy one, it was just people being real and it felt so f fly on the wall that it's, once that's out, it's very hard to get that back. And only when you can retrospectively look back, I love that moment, that thought, that, you know, making that a, a one tour, I look back and I could never have fathomed being part of it with so many of those players from the 97 tour. It definitely lit something in me where as soon as I became an international rugby player and I became a regular with Ireland and with enough lead time into the next Lions tour, it was definitely a, a major target. The sort of legacy of the film is, is a really lovely thing that there have been all of these players who are now British Lions or have been in the, in the years since. You know, who do attribute that film with being part of the fire that was putting their bellies to want to be a British lion. Having had it all begin in a pub when we were a bit pissed to end up having made something that that has inspired a whole lot of people and made people buy into what the British Lions is. You know, that's a pretty special thing, you know. So we must have done something halfway reasonably right. Yeah, as a legacy that the film has, it's a it's a pretty knockout one. I mean, you know, we were obviously very lucky, like we've been saying, with the people that were involved in it. And obviously it was really the British Lions winning the Test Series and, you know, the characters involved in that, that, you know, without that, there's nothing, obviously. But, um, yeah, it's a magical, special thing to have been part of. And, yeah. Living with Lions is the name of the film. Thanks to Duncan Humphreys and Fred Rees, who made it, I still can't believe they got the access they did. The footage is so raw, so natural. Probably because there weren't the tight controls and media management you get these days in elite sport. But even so, this was 1997, so ahead of its time. Let us know your standout moment at Inside Tour Pod. So the Lions have been on tour in South Africa for over a month by the time they touched down in Cape Town for the first test match 
I'm, I'm strolling in. It's not like I'm sprinting into the corner and just dotting it down. It was proper Moses in the parting of the sea. I mean, it was insane, really. The full story of that extraordinary contest at Newlands is dissected in episode eight. That dummy that he threw is possibly the best dummy ever thrown by any rugby player in the history of the game. You don't believe anything until the final whistle goes. I was doubting everything at that stage, you know. You just, you want to hear the whistle blown twice, almost just to make sure the game is over. This is a 94-19 production for Audi. If you've loved hearing about the Lions of 1997, check out the critically acclaimed book, This Is Your Everest, by Tom English and Peter Burns, the inside story of the 1997 Lions tour to South Africa, told by the players, coaches and managers on both sides. Insightful, funny, spine-tingling and full of raw emotion, it explores the tour in new depth to make it the perfect accompaniment to this podcast, Living With Lions, and the 2021 Lions tour to South Africa.